Good afternoon, class. I am really excited to have this most remarkable young woman here with us today. Lindsay Davis has been someone I've admired for many years. And um, I admire her for a number of things, her work ethic, her character, her wonderful attitude, especially in circumstances that might seem impossible to the rest of us. But the reason I invited her to come and talk to you today is that she has a history, a remarkable history of wanting to compete in the Olympic figure skating. And I'll let her tell you about her own story. But the thing that's going to blow your mind <laughs> is that she is a sport and performance psychology graduate from CBU. Yep. And wanted you to have this wonderful opportunity to hear from Lindsay about any of the topics that we're covering in long ethics. Thank you for coming today. And I don't know where you would like to begin, but I know you have a lot to say. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you, Professor Stan Phillip, for having me. Um, I'm super excited to be doing this. I think whenever I can kind of give back to the sport and performance psychology students, I'm happy to. Um, so if it's okay with you, I'll just kind of start off with a little bit of an introduction and background into who I am and, and what I do. Um, so if you can't tell, I actually am in my office here at CBU. Um, I am currently a career counselor at CBU's Career Center. So uh, long history with CBU. I attended um, my undergraduate study here in psychology and then also, um, like Professor Stanfield said, a former graduate of the Sport and Performance Psychology program here as well. Um, so Previous to that, I was actually a former professional athlete for almost 18 years. I was a competitive figure skater um, starting at the age of four and then retiring roughly around the ages of 22, almost 23. Um, so it was a wild ride filled with a lot of ups and downs. And probably like many of you, that's what spurred my passion for sport and performance psychology and um, had a lot of instances where I could have used a sport and performance psychologist in my time. I did get to work with a couple that I was very, very fortunate um, to do. And, um, and now I kind of work in a realm within the Career Center where I am still seeing athletes almost every day and helping them in sort of a, a different capacity than I ever thought uh, I would. So it's a little bit full circle here and God definitely had a plan. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Um, you had said also that you've done coaching. Yes, I taught figure skating as well as hockey for almost 15 years. So um, hockey was kind of a passion project of mine. My brother played hockey for years and years and I love just kind of teaching them the basics, um, edges, things like that, power moves, just to help them become better hockey players overall. Uh, and then with figure skating, I taught anywhere from young babies all the way through adults that just wanted to do it recreationally. And nothing at a major high level. I was too focused on school at the time to really put a whole lot of energy into high level coaching. Um, but I did have some some great times there and I really enjoyed it. So. Mm. You had mentioned also that you've seen it all. You've seen parallels in the rugged, ugly, harsh training that figure skaters go through. Some figure skaters, I hope not all, and parallels to the U.S. gymnastics team that have been so sorely treated. Anything you want to say about that? Yeah. So, and I, I definitely don't want to minimize it just to those two sports as I am positive that, you know, the same types of experiences that I had in figure skating that I know a lot of 
friends have actually had in gymnastics as well. It happens in almost every sport. And I think with these two particular sports, because individuals start at such a young age, there is a lot of opportunity for um, kind of grooming, if you will, um, sometimes in a really positive light and then other times in a really negative light. So um, I, I probably, I don't think I mentioned this in my introduction, but the level of skating that I did get to was the Olympic level. I did not make it to the Olympics, but I am a two-time US national medalist as well as a former Team USA member. I competed on Team USA for almost five years and um, also a national and, and international medalist. So I did everything I pretty much could do in figure skating without actually making it to the Olympics. And the experiences that I had along the way were everything from extremely positive and life altering as well as extremely negative. And the effects of that probably are still with me in some ways today. Um, so there's, there's definitely been things that I've experienced with pair skating with a partner, um, very close male coaches, as well as with female coaches and skating completely on my own. So I don't know how deep you want me to get into it, Professor Stanfield, but I'm happy to answer any further questions on, on that as well. Um, you had mentioned that, that you were in Russia. Mm -hmm. You want to share about what that was like? Yeah, that was an experience. If that's okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, I was in Sochi, Russia, the year of the Olympics, 2014. Um, our nationals is also our Olympic qualifying competition. So you have to skate really well at nationals, place top two, skate well at worlds, and then skate well at the Olympics. And so... Um, Right before I was set to compete in Sochi, Russia, I actually uh, suffered from a major concussion. I was skating pairs with a pair partner and I was dropped from a lift, um, split my head open, five staples, concussion. It kind of took me out for at least a good two months. And the mental game of trying to get back into skating and trusting your partner and just kind of um, you know, letting go of that fear of something like that happening again was very, very difficult for me. And ultimately, I would say that's probably one of the biggest impacting factors as to why I didn't skate well enough to make the Olympic team. Mm. So that was very difficult. Well, it, it makes me shudder to picture that as you're talking. Do you mind sharing it all? I know you said I think you said something like at least 50% of the issues that athletes face in your experience have to do with mental blocks. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking maybe you're talking about that now. Absolutely. Um, I can speak to my sport and I think those that I was a little closer to like gymnastics and dance and ballet and things like that. Um, I was telling Professor Stanfield previously to starting the um, recording today that I do believe some of the world's best athletes never actually make it to the highest stage that they possibly can when it comes to performance, simply because of, of uh, mental blocks that they have and issues that they experience just overcoming um, mental performance. So for me, I know that I, I suffered with that greatly. I was a very good competitor, but often had a lot of self-confidence um, issues. And that played out in the final year of my competitive history. Mm -hmm. And it definitely was the trajectory of why I pushed myself into sports psychology in general. Um, why? And I, why? Why, yes. So why? Because I just... I wanted to help other athletes and if I could just help one athlete not have to go through kind of the pain and the, um, you know, the, the suffering that one goes through and not fulfilling what they think is their life's goal because of one single performance and not just being on in the moment that it mattered, I felt like I could make a difference. And, um, I think, and sometimes you go into the sports psychology realm too, thinking that, you know, I'm going to really 
focus on working with high powered athletes and, you know, make an impact at the highest level possible. And in all honesty, sometimes it was working with a 10 year old little girl in the sport of figure skating that just needed help because, you know, mom and dad maybe had issues and she was bringing that onto the ice a little bit. And, um, or maybe she was just having a rough time at school and that was reflecting in her practice and her competitions on the ice. So there's so much more to just sports mm-hmm. like than helping that high, high caliber level of athletes as well and performers. Uh, you told me you've seen it all. <laughs> Um, the heights and the depths, mm-hmm. the good news and the bad news. Mm-hmm. I believe you said you've even been involved in a lawsuit. Mm-hmm. I didn't know if there's any of that that you want to speak to that would be helpful to this body of students. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I'm I'm willing to share on that most definitely. I think I can only speak to this on an athletic level, a former athlete level. Um, I certainly never experienced anything of that when I was, you know, in graduate school or even coaching myself. So everything that I talk about happened to me as an athlete. Um, I, we have a, a governing body called safe sport in figure skating and it was put into place as well as usa gymnastics and a bunch of other sports to really safeguard you know young athletes from a bunch of ethical issues and and dilemmas that have um really come to light i would say in the last you know 10 to 15 years so uh i've had my fair share in some of that i've definitely had some amazing coaches in my time and i've had some very mentally and physically abusive coaches in my time and um not too too long ago i was involved in a safe sport issue where um i had already retired from skating had been far removed from the competitive realm And a case had been opened on a particular coach that um, I was called in to kind of testify on anonymously. And um, obviously without providing, you know, too many details into the the situation, um, I had to give my personal testimony of what I had been through because another young girl had come forward about something that had happened to her by the same coach. And I had never spoken up about it. I didn't know at the time that it was something out of the norm or was not something that I should have been subjected to. And it took another young woman kind of opening up about it at some point and realizing that this was not okay. And um, now's the time that I'm going to speak up about it because I feel like the culture of acceptance has changed. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like I was fortunate to be able to do that and to be able to speak into that because it did definitely affect me negatively. Um, I think I still carry some things from my sport into how I am professionally. Um, And I would say negative things. And I would also say really positive things as well. I think I really strive for a level of excellence that skating instilled in me. And I'm forever grateful for that work ethic. Um, but at the same time, it was really difficult. And I've only recently understood that it's okay to be vulnerable in, in that aspect and what I've been through. So to be vulnerable, you mean to talk about it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I also thought at the time, you know, there's so many young girls that have it worse, right. Or have been through worse. Um, I was always extremely fortunate to have a very strong family support, And a lot of young girls that I was competing against at the time did not have that. And so I kind of felt like, you know, maybe there's there's things going on in my skating life, my coaching life that aren't totally appropriate and totally kosher. But at the same time, like I have a loving family. I'm doing great in school. I have all these other things that are going really well. So it kind of balances out. Mm. It's a very naive way to think about, you know, what could potentially be happening to your child in sports. Mm. Yeah. Oh, Lindsay, I (laughs) I got goosebumps just listening to you and what you've been through because you, as I said, class, such a lovely 
young woman that I've known for years and hate to hear that you went through situations that you knew on some level were not right, but you balanced it out by talking, thinking about your family support system and you went through it. Yeah. Now, especially since you have a sport and performance psychology degree and looking back, can you think of anything that would have helped you? Mm. Even though you had support from your family. Yeah, absolutely. I think some of that question, Professor Sanfield, is maybe a little twofold. I think that um, we're in a different era now where I think talking about things and um, being open about your past and, and stuff like that is a lot more accepted and it's a lot more of the norm now, I would say. I think back when I was still really in my competitive era, um, you know, it was kind of more hush hush. It was just like, this is the name of the game. This is what happens. Just suck it up. You want to get to the highest level you possibly can. It's just not something we talk about, right? Everybody goes through it in, in some way, shape or form which looking back now is a little insane to think that everybody went through some version of that in their own way. Um, but at the same time, I, I was able to work with a sports psychologist when I was about um, 15. Uh, some of the students may know he's kind of the, the grandfather of sports psychology. His name was Dr. Ken Revisa. And um, I didn't, I wasn't fortunate to work with him super long. It was only about a year that I was with one of my former competitive partners. We both used to see him and work with him. Um, in fact, I think Professor uh, Mario Soto has a, a wonderful mentor, had a wonderful mentorship with Dr. Aviza um, as well. And he, he was my first introduction into sports psychology and what this was and why it was relevant to me. Um, I used to think of it as kind of just like a shrink for athletes. I'm not sure why I needed one. I didn't see any issues at the time. But that relationship with that sports psychologist is also what sparked my interest in helping other athletes because it was so much more than just, mm. you know, why can't you skate well or what's going on and, and things like that. It was you know, talk to me about your communication level. How do you relate with other people? What's, you know, your vision of teamwork? What does that look like to you? Um, there were so many deeper things there that really got me to kind of think about who I am as a person and how does my sport affect me as a person too. Mm. So I would say about 15, I, I started working with a sports psychologist um, and they have you work with a sports psychologist when you get onto Team USA as well. Um, the, you know, United States spends a lot of money on their Team USA competitors, and they want to make sure that you're top notch. And that also includes, you know, mental performance. So there's been a, a much more broad acceptance of mental performance and how that affects athletes, I would say, in the last, you know, 20 to 25 years than there's ever been. So um, very fortunate in that aspect to have a taste of that at the end of my competitive career. And it did really help me uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. But, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately had that last gate that wasn't the greatest. And um, it put me on a, a career path that I think was really fulfilling in the end. To be exposed to mm -hmm. a board psychologist or two and the way they helped you. I would say both. I mean, um, the work that I did with a sports psychologist was very impactful for me personally. I always tied my value as a person to my worth as an athlete. And that was mm -hmm. such an, a, a horrible way to look at what you have to offer the world and who you are. And um, I think that was the first time that I really took a step back from my sport and said, mm, I'm so much more than this. I'm so much more than just an athlete. And I'm worth so much more than just my last performance. So that was that was my first taste with that. Well, thank God you were able to transform that thinking so that you could recover from that severe blow. Yeah. And there are a lot of high level performers that 
you know, they don't, they really struggle when they no longer have their sport kind of guiding them. And um, I've seen that firsthand with other friends that have, you know, won Olympic gold medals, and now they're out of the sport and, you know, floundering because that was their ultimate life goal. And it's really been an amazing process to see some high level athletes discover that their their values are what drive them and drive their behavior and their values are so much more important than their goals because values dictate behavior and if i can really ground myself in Mm -hmm. my values and what is true to me then i can set my sights on anything Mm -hmm. so Well, gosh, what a joy to meet with you today. I told you that I'm sure that the students would have enjoyed having you live. (laughs) Anytime. To to answer questions that they might have. Is there one parting thought you would want to give to the student based on your amazing life story? Oh man, there's probably so many thoughts. Um, There's probably two actually that I would love to give. Uh, The first one is overall with the, the aspect of sports psychology. It's not something that I would ever pigeonhole yourself into thinking there's only one way to work with athletes or work with performers and first responders. There are so many different ways to make an impact with this degree than just working with pro sports teams. And um, I just would love everybody in this class to understand that that journey looks different for everyone. And just because you get this degree and maybe you take something that's not fully related to sports psychology doesn't mean that, you know, God doesn't have a plan to maybe bring you back full circle with it. Like you. Like me, like me, I'm a true testament of that. And at first I was, you know, maybe a little disappointed. I thought I was going to go right out the bat with sports psych and work with professional athletes and, you know, be here. And then I really realized like you're, you can make a difference and a massive impact and work your way up to that. So uh, that's probably my first piece of advice to, to SPP students, Um, just be open to everything, every possibility presented to you say yes to a lot. Um, And then my second piece, you know, because I am a career counselor here at CBU and I see how important it is to attack uh, your sports psychology degree professionally, I would say, you know, be prepared, right? Get your professional portfolio aligned with what you want to do after you graduate. Um, Start thinking about that now. Hit the pavement running full force. And I'm always here for you at the Career Center if you ever need. And um, yeah, that's probably my two cents there. (laughs) Well, it's more like a million dollars to me. (laughs) Thank you. God bless you for your generosity today. And thank you for being vulnerable with us about how life has been pretty tough. And yet you, you have bounced back and not only um, are supporting yourself, but you're using your degree in ways that you hadn't imagined. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me, Professor Stanfield. Um, I get so excited whenever I have the opportunity to just talk about sports psychology or my former athletic history. And um, you all have amazing professor as well. I've, I've served her directly. So learn everything you can from this amazing person so you're you're so generous god bless you and have a great day thank you you too